Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring awakening inside of the quantum dream. My guest is Paul Levy. He is the author of The Madness of George Bush, a reflection of our collective psychosis, as well as Dispelling Watiko, Breaking the Curse of Evil, Awakened by Darkness When Evil Becomes Your Father, and The Quantum Revelation, a Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality. He's been a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner for 30 years, and he is also I'm going to call him a Jungian practitioner, working with individuals and groups. Once again, this is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Hello, Paul. I'm delighted to be with you. I, I am so happy to be here, Jeffrey. Thank you. It's a real pleasure uh, that we're actually connecting, and I guess it's worth mentioning. We've uh, tried twice before and run into technical problems and, uh, that interfered with uh, really creating a broadcast quality video. In fact, the recorder just didn't work at all. The only time that's ever happened to me, which suggests maybe it's because we're dealing with material which is so powerful. Yeah, that was my sense. Um, I couldn't believe it. We did two full interviews. They came out great. And then both of them didn't record. So it really occurred to me, wow, it's as, it's as if some sort of darker force is not wanting the information I'm sharing to get out, or at least that was what I imagined. And uh, largely, we were focusing in uh, the earlier two interviews on your concept of the Watiko, which is a dark force. Yeah, absolutely. And and um the the Watiko idea, it's it's a Native American, it's a Cree Indians came it's their term, and it really connotes this cannibalistic um spirit or the spirit of evil. And it's a psychospiritual disease of the soul, and whose origin is the soul or the psyche. Um and it plays itself out through our through the projective tendencies of our mind, through that we all have these, you know blind spots in our psyche it plays itself out through our blind spots in such a way that we then unwittingly become the instrument to act it out in the world and at the same time it hides itself from from being seen and so it's actually this form of this blindness it's a psychic blindness that part of the blindness um is that we don't know we're blind when we're when we're afflicted with it and, um, you know, and it's actually the disease that is the, the fundamental disease that's enacting itself out in our world through us as individuals and collectively as a species that we're actually um, seeing getting enacted and embodied and, you know, and played out in the greater body politic of our world. And the thing about Watiko that I, because it's such an amazing idea when you really understand what it's actually pointing at it's a psychospiritual disease of the soul whose origin is the human psyche like i've been saying and yet it has this magical ability to somehow extend itself out in the world and configure events in the in the outer world so as to synchronistically reflect what's going on inside a psyche that's under its thrall so that's amazing because it it actually dissolves this the boundary which isn't it doesn't even exist between the inner and the outer in such a way that you know it actually reflects itself through the outer world and what i'm describing where an inner situation in the psyche is actually getting reflected through the outer medium of the world that's a dream. That's exactly a way of describing a dream where the outer dreamscape is actually reflecting the state, the inner state of the dreamer. That's a very complex thought, uh, but it, it also suggests to me that uh, certain people are more afflicted 
apparently than others, although it's a collective disease, we all share in it. And, and one of the symptoms seems to be pointing at evil outside of oneself. Right, right, right. So we all have what, Hiko, it, it exists in potential in the collective unconscious of our species, and it feeds off of polarization and fear and separation and otherness. So if somebody's embodying like that spirit of Watiko, and if we point at them thinking, oh, they have Watiko and we don't, then that very perspective that we've just assumed is an expression that we've fallen under the thrill of the bug, so to speak. And um, yeah, and the idea, the actual understanding that any of us, to the extent that we become fully and utterly enlightened, whatever, even if that's even possible. But, um, you know, until that point, we all can potentially just think about it. Who among us hasn't acted out there unconscious? We all do. That's the way we become conscious is to act it out. So we all are, you know, have like the propensity to fall under the spell of our unconscious and then unwittingly act out with Tico. When, when you see that, you discover, oh, wow, well, I can, there's a humbleness that arises out of that. And that humbleness, that's the inoculation against the, the disease. Combined with when you see somebody else who's embodying what Tico, um, not only do you understand, oh, we all potentially have that, but being a dream, because the way to see what Tico is to and we'll talk about this as to tap into the to the dreamlike nature of reality, is to understand that what they're embodying, if they're, say, at that moment taken over by the Watiko spirit, they're actually this dream character reflecting that, you know, dark, sick, wounded, evil, whatever, however you would characterize it, that part of, of oneself. I think it's well understood in psychology and even the average layperson can grasp the idea easily that every figure, every image, every character that appears in a dream is really an expression of one's own psyche. Yeah, that's exactly it. Because when you begin to see the, the dreamlike nature, which is what what Hiko is actually revealing to us, then you discover, oh, we're all dream characters, which means we're not separate from each other. We're all interconnected, interdependent aspects of each other. And that's a whole other way of actually beginning to see. Because the thing about Watiko, it it only has power over us to the extent we don't see it. So that's why I was saying it acts out through our unconscious, through the blind spots, through the projective tendencies of the mind. As soon as we see how it operates, both out in the world and within our own minds through our unconscious reactions, then all of a sudden we begin to take away its, its autonomy and its power and we actually start to empower ourselves. So if I could just describe in real, like sort of essential form, like, you know, one way, because there are like so many ways that I've imagined in pointing at it, because my work is basically trying to point at this entity or seeming entity because it actually doesn't even exist. That's the ultimate, that's the, the crazy part is that ultimately what Hiko doesn't have in, any independent intrinsic existence separate from our own mind. And what that is implying, that's showing that we have this incredible untapped invisible power. Each one of us does this creative power, but to the extent we're not awake to it, then we unconsciously acted out in a way that's killing us, as is evidenced um, by what's happening in the world. So if I could just describe, in essence, how Watiko works, and one really simple way of understanding it, just through the imagination. Imagine you're in a dream at night, and imagine you have a particular point of view in that dream. Well, that 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 viewpoint that you're holding is gonna get reflected back by the dream because the dream is nothing other than your own mind. So whatever viewpoint you hold um, instantaneously, not both over time and in no time whatsoever, outside of time, the dream will reflect back your viewpoint because the dream is nothing other than your own psyche. And then all of a sudden now you have evidence confirming your viewpoint that it's objectively true. So then you get even more fixed in your viewpoint of what you're seeing is actually objective, separate from you. And the more you hold that viewpoint, but the more the dream will just give you evidence confirming the seeming truth of your viewpoint in a feedback loop whose source is, is our own mind. And what I just described is we have this genius power of, of creating reality, of co-creating reality with the universe. And what, what Tico does, one way of, of conceiving of it is that it plugs into our creative genius 
in such a way that it turns us against ourselves so that we imprison ourselves by the reality creating function and the creative genius and unbelievable power that we have unknowingly inside of all of us. And it turns it against us to the point where it's killing us. And so what I'm pointing at in my work is trying to shed light on that process. And there's no one else doing that to us. There's no Watiko out there. There's no evil forces out there who's doing that to us. We have entranced, it's like we've entranced ourselves. We've hypnotized ourselves, tricked ourselves in a way out of our own mind. And so what I'm pointing at is that, hey, look, when you actually like shed light on that process and see it, you begin to connect and get in phase and in alignment with that just incredible creative power that we have to create our experience of ourselves and our experience of the world. And that's where quantum physics comes in. So I'll, I'll just want to offer that. And I can say a lot more about that. I think the really intriguing step that you take in, in all of this is, if I understand you correctly, you're really saying that what we think of as the external objective world around us is also like a dream, that everything is a reflection of ourselves. Right. That's exactly it. And that's the segue into quantum physics, because that's what quantum physics really discovered. So, you know, um, before quantum physics came on the scene, uh, you know, all of the, you know, this, the physics community thought that this world was objective and that we were just studying this subjective world and trying to understand how it worked. And so then like a um, hundred years ago, a little bit longer uh, onto the scene comes quantum physics. And it basically empirically proved there's no such thing as, a, as an objective world. And one other way of saying that is that they discovered that the act of observing the world actually influenced the world that you were observing, which is to say, so the observer is the observed, um, the act of observation, the object observed, and the process of observing were all one interconnected quantum system. And what that means is that the act of observation is creative. You see, it's pointing at, it's shedding light on that we are creative beings and we're creating our experience of ourselves and of the universe each and every moment. And so that's the rabbit hole. That's that I go because I, I wrote a book about quantum physics because basically what that's showing us, that is literally revealing quantum physics is revealing to us the dreamlike nature. It's literally showing us that this is a dream. And not only is it showing us this is a dream, quantum physics and the revelations that are emerging from quantum physics are themselves the expression of the very dream that it's revealing. And um, so why I bring up quantum physics is because quantum physics is the medicine for Watiko. Because Watiko, if you remember, I was saying it operates through the projective tendencies of our mind in such a way that we actually entrance ourselves, putting ourselves under a spell. And one way of understanding that is, you know, we actually by operating through the projective tendencies of the mind, which we're always do, we're always projecting. So we project onto the waking ink blot and we, you know, create whatever experience we're, or perception we're having. And then, like I was describing in that dream metaphor, we then entrance ourselves into thinking that what we're seeing out there is objective, is separate from us. And then we react to it and we become conditioned by our own projection. And um, so that, in a sense, is is one way of understanding, um, the, you know, the, the Watiko virus, because it's like a virus of the mind. Interesting, viruses are so much, you know, on all of our minds right now. Well, Watiko is the real fundamental, it, it's, it's um, a higher dimensional virus that the coronavirus, we can talk about this, is actually a lower level emanation into our world and into our minds. But the source of, of that is the Watiko virus, and um, I'm just finishing up a big article about that. But if I could just describe even a little bit more how Watiko maps onto this, because say if any of us, you know, aren't connected with our shadow, with our darker half, right? And we're all familiar, oh, well, I want to own my shadow. Well, the way that process works, so think about it, you, you split off from your own shadow. So what happens? It gets projected outside of you. So just imagine, you know, being in a dream. Because, you know, if you remember, quantum physics is showing us the dreamlike nature. So if this is some sort of dream and we project out our shadow, well, then into the dream is going to walk some person or a group of people who are going to carry that projection and who are going to embody that shadow that we've dissociated from and projected outside of ourselves. 
And as soon as they come into our dream, all of a sudden, now we have evidence. Oh, the dark of the shadow is out. The evil is out there, you know. And so we, we don't recognize that it's actually that we're looking at a mirror. And, um, and so then what happens, what do we typically do if that process gets really unfolded? And that is we try to kill them because we're just basically acting out in the world the very inner process of trying to get rid of and kill our own darkness by projecting that side of ourselves. When it appears in front of us, we enact that very inner process on them. And by trying to, you know, to kill them in that way, whatever way we do, um, we then are literally becoming possessed by the very evil that we're trying to kill in the outside world in a mind created feedback loop. That's totally insane. And, um, you know, and of course, the more I see them in that shadowy way, the more they're going to manifest that way. And the more they manifest that way, the more evidence I have to confirm my viewpoint. That's the feedback loop. That's how Watika works through, through you know, through uh, the psyche and through projecting the shadow. That's the psychological mechanism that Watika works. But then bringing in quantum physics. So I was describing Watika gets entranced by the projective tendencies onto our world think it's object thinking the world's objective becoming conditioned by it well then here comes quantum physics saying oh by the way that world that you think is objective it, it there is no such thing that's a nonsensical idea that's an antiquated idea that's a false idea and the thing which is amazing is when you begin to see through that illusion of the objective world something really unbelievable happens and what happens is all of a sudden you begin to question, wait a second, what about the subject? What about who I am? If there's no object out there, as I need an object to be in a relationship to if I'm going to be a subject, when I more and more understand that there is no object, there's no object of anything, this is quantum physics has empirically proven this. When you really take that in, it all of a sudden sheds light on the nature of who you are. And that's where quantum physics has promoted itself to become a spiritual tradition because it's actually shedding light on our true nature. I think there's a paradox there uh, because uh, if subject object distinction isn't real, then the idea that quantum physics can empirically prove anything is also has to be called into question because empirical science depends on a subject object distinction. That's so interesting to contemplate because in a way we have literally dreamed in quantum physics into the universe a hundred or so years ago into the world through physicists' minds and, and into our minds. And so, yeah, the idea of what is actually, what is real, well, one thing that quantum physics is saying is that this universe is of the nature of a dream. It's not like a dream. It's not sort of metaphorically talking. This is like a dream. Quantum physics is basically the revelation of the dream to us. It's showing us. It's proving to us that this is a dream. And if I could talk about that. So in Tibetan, because I do t Tibetan Buddhist practice, you could probably tell just from, you know, in back of me. And, um, you know, they're the, the tradition that I do practice too, there's a tradition called Terma. And the Terma tradition, it actually translates as the hidden treasures. And the idea of the Terma, and it's how the, the lineage actually will, will regenerate itself and keep itself fresh and propagate itself so it doesn't get, get like stuck in dogma or, you know, or and it just, you know, kind of becomes some sort of idol that's not, that's not really, you know, having this immense power. So the Terma tradition, the hidden treasure, uh, the, that tradition, what it's about is that there are these hidden treasures, hidden encoded in the fabric of the universe, because the universe, like a dream, is multidimensional. And sometimes the treasures take the form of a blessed object or, or a teaching. And one way to think about it, it's an alarm clock that right at the time that we fall asleep or that we become, if you think about it, if we get like one-sided and we're too, whether it's, oh, I'm too sort of into, you know, whatever, like I'm a materialist, say, and I've forgotten the spiritual, the idea being it's like a dream. A dream is, is a compensation. When you get one-sided, the dream will compensate symbolically. The language of dreams are symbols. And interestingly, quantum physics is a symbolic procedure. 
Um, and so all of a sudden, you get one-sided or asleep in a certain way, your unconscious through your dreams will offer you a symbol that if you recognize it, it will get you back in balance. So terma, uh, termas or the hidden treasures, they're these, in a way, these symbolic crystallizations that come into our world, world and out of our world. And they're like the, these, these vitamins that we, that, that the universe secretes to help us to get ourselves back in balance. And it's a real thing. It's not just some sort of fairy tale thing. Scholars study this terma tradition. Like this is like an amazing thing. This is how this lineage, you know, propagates itself, you know, to the current day over centuries and um, to transmit these enlightened um, teachings. And what I'm pointing out, I just gave a talk about this a few months ago, that quantum physics is a modern day analog to a terma. In other words, we have dreamed up quantum physics into our universe so as to help us remember who we are, to help us remember our incredible creative power and, um, you know, to connect us with the immense creativity that we always have 24 seven, but to the extent that we're unconscious of it, like I've been saying, that creative power gets turned against us both individually and collectively, um, in a way that's killing us. So that, that in essence, um, you know, the idea that quantum physics is actually a terma is a hidden treasure and not, it's not the only terma, like there are like countless termas that are, that are emerging in our world. And, um, but quantum physics is one of them that I think has particular this relevance when we're talking about the Watiko mind virus. Because essentially, as I understand it, what quantum physics is saying, the, the Schrodinger equations of quantum physics in particular suggest that reality as described by these fundamental equations is, is a big probability field. It's not solid at all until we observe it. Right. That's exactly right. And, and that's actually when you really contemplate just that, what you just said, it, it's so inspiring. And I'll just give you an example. So, you know, um, and now keep in mind that quantum physics has discovered that this universe is quantum on all scales. It's quantum through and through. So even though it's the study of the really, really small trying to find the building blocks of this universe, um, it actually has discovered, well, that there is no fundamental building, substantial building block separate from conscious, from our own consciousness. That's really interesting, but it's also, like I was saying, um, discovering that this universe is quantum through and through. And here's one way of understanding that with what you just said, Jeffrey, that really I think is helpful in that you have these quantum entities and before they're observed, they exist in a state of potentiality in such a way that they, um, any and every way they could ever potentially manifest, they manifest, or they, they, they're, they're, they're existing in this potential parallel universe. And as soon as we observe that quantum entity in whatever way we do, all of those potentialities just vaporize and disappear as if they never existed. And then one of them will actualize at that moment. And that's what we call reality. Now, here's the thing which is amazing. What quantum physics is saying is that even if one of those, you know, countless potentialities was, to quote a quantum physicist, highly, incredibly, ridiculously unlikely, it could still be the very universe that manifests right now in this very next moment. And so all of a sudden it enlarges the realm of the possible of what's possible. Because for example, if we think because of what's happening in our world right now, oh, things are hopeless and, you know, um, we're destroying ourselves and, you know, destroying the, the biosphere, the life support system of the planet, and then totalitarianism. And by the way, Jung um, didn't know the word Watiko, but he, um, actually was really switched on to the idea. He called it a number of different names all throughout his collective works, but one of his favorite names for it was totalitarian psychosis. Okay, and think about what I was saying before that the thing about Watiko, it, it's like this, this pathology, this pathogen that subsumes and co-ops the healthy parts of the psyche into its service so that it colonizes the psyche and creates a shadow government. And it's, it, so it like dictates like a dictator to the ego. So it sets up a totalitarian regime in the human psyche that's afflicted with it. Well, 
remember what I said qua, that that what Tico it's actually reflected like a fra like an iteration of a fractal through the outside world where the macrocosm mirrors the microcosm. So that inner state of being afflicted by Watiko and having your mind colonized by this like totalitarian sort of this regime, that's actually getting reflected through the outside world. And once we recognize that, that actually expands our consciousness because we're seeing the dreamlike nature and that point of view helps us to dispel Watiko. But if I could just go back to what I was trying to say about when we get, um, you know, entranced by the horrors that are playing out in our world today and the suffering and the nightmare that's happening, and we become pessimistic, then by holding that viewpoint, we're then going to draw evidence to confirm our pessimism in a mind-created feedback loop such that we become um, not the solution, but we become part of the problem. But when you understand that quantum physics is saying, hey, even if something is r incredibly, ridiculously unlikely, it can still happen. That means that the fact that, that our species could sufficiently wake up in time to avert the impending catastrophe, that's a possibility. That's an absolutely real possibility according to quantum physics. And so, and if we're not, you know, envisioning that, then what are we thinking? You know, the idea being is that this is the power of our dreaming, that we have this incredibly creative power. And when you see Watiko, you don't want to become fascinated by it, but seeing it then, that's the inoculation. And then as a sovereign being, we can invest our intention, our attention in creating the world we want to live in. So then we can actually dream up and envision a world in which we're all actually having the recognition of our interconnectedness, our interdependence, that if I help you, it helps me. That's the world that I'm dreaming. And it's more and more of us are dreaming that world together you know, then by the power of our dreaming, we can literally materialize that into that's that's the incredible creative dreaming power that all of us have. Now, when I think of dreams normally, I think of them, they're my dreams. They're inside of my head only. Uh, no one else is responsible for my dreams but me. But when we look at reality, uh, external reality, uh, it seems to me that there, there's a Buddhist term that, that seems appropriate. I think it's something like mutually dependent co-arising. Right, right. Interdependent co-origination. And it's, yeah, I've, I've written extensively about that. And it's basically, you know, that's an expression of, um, that there's, you know, that there's, no, there's no thing. There's no objective anything, including us. Like, I only exist as a being, and I'm in relationship to you, I don't exist intrinsically independently from my own side, but I, I exist, you know, in this relation to you, but you don't exist as an independent, intrinsically existing objective person, because you only exist relative to other beings who themselves don't exist objectively or independently or intrinsically, but they exist, you know, in relation to, and we all exist interrelated to each other. And there's no like fixed point this that's not a reference point in and of itself we're all part of an interconnected interdependent web and we're not just these separate aspects of the web that are interacting no that's still a subtle form of seeing in a, in a dualistic way quantum physics is pointing out the wholeness of this universe that this universe is seamlessly whole on every level and like just one thing i want to just um contemplate for a moment one way of understanding what i'm talking about through the imagination and entering into imagine we have we're having a dream and imagine you're in a dream and imagine all of a sudden you have the recognition that you're dreaming and you have lucidity and then imagine that some of the other dream characters who are just aspects of yourself they're also waking up to the dreamlike nature and having lucidity and imagine you all come together and hang out and you just trip out on what you're realizing you contemplate it going oh my god we're in this universe this is this this is a dream universe that we moment by moment are co-dreaming into materialization together moment by moment and that's always been the case but we didn't realize it and because we didn't realize it we were dreaming it up in a way that was deeply problematic but you know and i'm just imagining um as more and more people who are having that realization come together 
and share what they're realizing. It's what I call, they're, they're realizing their, their sacred power of dreaming. It's the part of us that's dreaming the dream moment by moment into materialization. Every moment, the question is whether we know it or not. But as we wake up to that and we connect with each other, we can put our sacred power of dreaming together in a way to change the dream in a way that makes a difference, in a way that we can, you know, it, it's an evolutionary impulse that we are invited to participate in our own evolution through this realization. And what I just described in a night dream, that's what's actually um, offered to us in the waking dream. Now, you wrote at one point that if the Watiko didn't exist, and I think by Watiko, we could talk about Satan or the Archons or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ariman or any other sort of evil demonic force. Right. If it didn't exist already, and, and as you point out, it doesn't really exist, but if it didn't, we'd have to create it. Right, right, exactly. I, I talk about that in my book because it is the greatest catalyst for human evolution that and and you know that we need and um you know an example being you know just think of here's the buddha under the bodhi tree and he's you know about to become enlightened and then all the the darker forces the evil one here's here's this mara figure who's you know tormenting him and trying to seduce him and really trying to obstruct him in any way that he can from attaining enlightenment and from one point of view Oh, wow, that Mara figure, that evil energy is like, you know, kind of like this adversary and really getting in the way of Buddha's realization. But when you have like a deeper point of view, you understand, no, Mara was secretly Buddha's ally, that Mara helped Buddha to develop the muscle of realization that catapulted him out of the separate self, you know, um, into the realization of our of our oneness, into into enlightenment, and you know what I'm pointing at is that um, in in the you know the, these darker energies, because um, think about it in a dream when darkness is really visible and palpable, that's an expression that an incredibly powerful light is is nearby, and so what I'm pointing at is that encoded in the darkness. Um, it's actually potentially helping us if we recognize that. And a way to understand that is like Watiko itself is a quantum phenomena. And what I mean by that, a quantum phenomena here, think about light. Well, you know, when quantum physics, you know, came the advent of quantum physics, they discovered, oh, well, what is the nature of light? Sometimes it appears as a wave, sometimes as a particle. Is it a wave or a particle? Well, it depends how we observe it, right? That was the experiment, the um, two-slit experiment that really, you know, completely um, had encoded within the whole experiment all of quantum physics right there. And it was where consciousness intruded into the physics lab and they couldn't make it go away. And so the idea that 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 here here is light that what is its nature it depends how we observe it well the same and and keep in mind that waves and particles you couldn't even imagine more opposite entities and so here is watiko watiko is the source of the most incredible archetypal not just personal but archetypal evil that we enact on ourselves with each other between each other and amongst ourselves as a species and encoded in watiko is the most profound blessing it's helping us it's a terba not only quantum physics is a terma, but what Tico is a terma, a hidden treasure. It's actually a revelation. It's showing us the dreamlike nature. It's un and by by showing us the dreamlike nature, what that means is that it's unlocking the incredible creative power that all of us have. But we, to the extent we don't know it, it boomerangs and kills us. And so, so is Watiko, so in a superposition of states, being a quantum phenomena, Watiko both contains the the deepest evil that can destroy us. Or the most, not just its medicine, but an actual blessing. It's actually helping us to wake up. And how it manifests, just like light, it's a function of how we observe it, of how we dream it. That's that's what this is all about. That's what my work is trying to get out to people. And when, when more and more of us have that realization, and like I was suggesting, connect with each other and activate our collective genius and, and, and have the realization we can conspire to co-inspire each other, which is a true conspiracy theory. We can have the recognition of our interconnectedness, of our, that we're not separate, and, and put our genius together in a way that we can dream ourselves awake. 
That's another way of saying it. And that's freely being offered to us. You know, and there are very few, I mean, there are actually lots of people who are talking about it, but I just want to add my voice. What you're saying reminds me of what I think is is one of the most mysterious and profound statements that come out of the Christian tradition. Uh, I'm not a Christian, but I keep thinking about this all the time. Uh, when when Jesus said, resist not evil, I, I think it's a very subtle point, but he's, I, I think he was trying to say something along the same lines that you're getting at. Yeah, well, and it's interesting because that brings up how I discovered what I'm talking about. And, um, and it was through personal experience that almost killed me. Because, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but it, you know, I'm an only child and my father unwittingly, you know, was a channel for Watiko. He just like, you know, like people do to the, if, the extent they're not, you know, doing their own inner work. Well, then they unwittingly act out their unhealed abuse. And my father did that. And being a sensitive kid, like we all are, I was the recipient. And it just created enormous suffering. And, and to the point where I went from being a highly accomplished kid to not being able to live my life. And, and then I went so deeply inwards into my mind to try to get to the root of that. I, you know, I was in my early to mid twenties and I had a huge, you know, mind blowing spiritual awakening that got me. And I was so excited and enthusiastic of what I was realizing, which is that, Hey, we're having a collectively shared dream. I was realizing that and it was completely blowing my mind. And I, there's no way you can be prepared for that. At least I wasn't. And, but I was so excited that it, it got me in deep trouble. It got me hospitalized and diagnosed and, and, you know, and my parents bought into the, the diagnosis. And then, you know, after a number of years later, they died completely convinced that I'm just deluded and mentally ill and in denial of my illness. So it had a real tragic aspect, but I was fortunate that I was able to get out of the psychiatric system really quick and continue my awakening because it was being reflected back to me that I was mentally ill, that I was bipolar, that I would have this illness for the rest of my life. And, and as I was being diagnosed, I was diagnosing the psychiatrist as just being incredibly just stupid. I just, they had no idea, you know, what I was going through. And thankfully, not for one second did I buy into their diagnosis, but I knew it was just made so clear to me that I was having an awakening. And so, but the point is, I began to recognize, because with my father in my family system, whenever I was pointing out the darkness that he was playing out, it was like the whole field non-locally configured to protect the abuser. And then psychiatry came in and they aligned with my father. And I became the identified patient and I became the one who was sick or bad or evil or whatever it was. And the one who was actually the real channel for evil, everybody was protecting him. And I began to realize, oh my God, there's, you know, this, this is crazy making. It was driving me out of my mind. And I was realizing it's showing me something that it's this, this revelation of a deeper, higher dimensional process that's playing out in our world. And when you see that was when I began, I didn't have the name for it. So when I wrote my first book um, about the badness of George W. Bush, I was, it was all about Watiko, but I, I didn't have the name yet. So I was calling it malignant ego phrenia. It was an aberration of the human ego and, um, and the, you know, in a way, so, um, the, the short name was malignant egophrenia could be abbreviated as M E disease, me disease. It was a misidentification of who we think we are to the extent that we unconsciously identify. You see the thing about what Tico here, it, it hates when I do this, but I, I'm trying to articulate, um, here's how it works. It's it, it, in, the, in the apocryphal text of the Bible, they talk about Watiko. They call it um, the counterfeiting spirit. So Watiko puts us on, which has a double meaning of putting us on like a suit of clothes, but also it, it, it you know, is um, a deceiver. It fools us. So it puts us on and it impersonates us. It's an imposter. And if we're unaware of what's happening, we then identify with its false version and limited version of who we are. And then we unwittingly have offered ourselves to become a conduit or an instrument to act out what you go in the world. And all the while we're identifying, it's like when you get like this tapeworm in your, in your organism and the tapeworm secretes chemicals. So you start craving certain food and you're eating the food thinking you're feeding yourself. And meanwhile, the tapeworm is getting bigger. You're actually feeding it. 
and until it kills you. But it doesn't want to kill you too soon, or then it would suffer the inconvenience of having to find a new host. So that's that's like what Tico. It it really it apes us. And interesting in you know the whole idea of that that, that you know that um, Satan is the ape of God, and so it apes us and impersonates us. It's this mimic. It's a mime, and. Um, you know, it puts us on, and then that's how it fools us. So, in essence, we then, you see, Watiko can't steal our soul. It tricks us into giving it away. So, that's where we then give away ourselves, and we then disconnect from our own power. And and that's the state of un, of asleep humanity. And so, that's why I'm basically pointing at that the medicine is all around us. It's freely offered to us. It's when enough of us actually wake up to the incredible, like, intrinsic creative power of our genius. That's who we are. Well, that's very elegantly put, Paul. And, you know, I know we could talk about this for a long time, and I hope we have many more conversations, but this is so deep and so profound, I don't want to overload our viewers right now. And, and so I think this may be a good point to pause uh, it's really been a delight to be with you. I think this is one of the most profound conversations uh, that I've been able to offer to our viewers on the New Thinking Aloud channel. So I'm very grateful for our time together. And, and I hope we can do many more because because I know there are all sorts of variations on these essential topics we've been discussing. Yeah, no, I, I so appreciate it, Jeffrey. And let me just say, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface. I mean, it's such a mind-blowing thing, really. It, it, it is, and I think you're really putting your, your thumb on, on the heart of, of one of the deepest issues that affects all of us. And uh, it's an urgent issue also, but I think that uh, it doesn't help us to become alarmed by it. We have to face it with a certain amount of poise and, and calmness. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, many more conversations with you, Paul. Well, really appreciate that, Jeffrey. Same here. Thank you. Thank you for being with me. And for those of you watching this video, thank you for being with us.